Yo, Dave Lockerin with Odd Shopper back again with you guys. Happy to have you with us. Week one in the books. Nathaniel Hackett can go to hell, but that's besides the point. We 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 live to see another day. I got picks for every single game for you. Thursday, all the way through Mondays, not really a double header because they're running these games concurrently, oddly enough, but all 16 games, whether it's a side, a total, even through a teaser in on one of these, uh, we'll get to that as well. But mind you, I'm going to tell you the games that I love. I'm going to tell you the games that are okay and the games that really I'm just leaning one way or don't have a good feel. Because if anybody tells you they look at a slate of 16 games and goes, man, I got I feel like I have a significant edge on all 16 of these games, they're just not telling you the truth. So hit that thumbs up if you're ready to dive into this one, make some money this week. Subscribe to the channel, helps us greatly. And leave a comment down below. I try and read and respond to all the, let me know your favorite picks for this week. You agree with me, disagree with me, whatever. And shortly later, I'll tell you how to get $200 free with MGM. They're giving free money out. We're going to take it if we get the opportunity. Let's dive into it. Chargers at the Chiefs. Chargers getting four and a half. We kick off Thursday night football with an absolute banger here. I know a lot of the money's coming in on the Chiefs, but it's moved to four and a half in a lot of spots. Keenan Allen's been ruled out. So understandably, that doesn't help the Chargers here. But in the Justin Herbert era, this has been a Chargers team that has fought tooth and nail against the Chiefs. The only two games that they've lost, the only two games that they've lost in four games that they played against each other, of course, division rivals, the last two years you've had Justin Herbert. The only two games they've lost, both of them in overtime. He got a win last year, Herbert and the Chargers, 24-20 early in the season. And then they won another game, week 18, that doesn't really matter because Patrick Mahomes and company weren't playing. But I just look for this to be a very competitive game. I know it's at Arrowhead Stadium. I know the Chiefs are dominant and, and Patrick Mahomes looked great last week. But when you look at the defensive line for the Chargers, so much better than the Arizona Cardinals. Just not even comparable. Cardinals are, are Chandler Jones is gone. They have no pass rush really to speak of. Uh, and when you look at the Chargers, you're talking about Joey Bosa. You're talking about Khalil Mack. They have a good secondary. Obviously, JC Jackson is yeah, something worth monitoring for sure. But all in all, I think this game stays competitive uh, and, the, and the Chargers get there plus four and a half. Not, not willing to take the money line here, but Chargers plus four and a half on the road. Patriots at the Steelers. Now, all right. Steelers last game picked off Joe Burrow five times. Seven sacks. Absolute phenomenal defensive performance by the Steelers. Now, they lost TJ Watt, though, which is huge. But he had one sack. The rest of this team had six. They really look, the defense looked significantly better than I thought. Now, granted, if you're on the Bengals like I was, it's frustrating to see that they still took that game to overtime despite all of that madness. Despite five picks, seven sacks, they still took the Steelers to overtime. But the problem here is I can look at the Steelers and go, you know what, divisional game, they came out strong, they came out hot, shouldn't last. Well, the Patriots on the other side, they looked awful. Mac Jones is dealing with, with back spasms as well. And with Pittsburgh, Najee Harris said he's good to go and he expects to play. I mean, really, I don't know, especially with this offensive line in, in New England, how they're going to move the football. This is one of the games that I don't have the strongest lean on. And I think, you know, just judging by the line, most don't. But if I'm taking anything here, I'm going to go and ride with Pittsburgh money line at plus 110. And right now, uh, you could get that over at BetMGM. Uh, is where you're going to find the best the, the best line on that, on the money line. All right. Commanders at the Lions. Here is a fun one. And uh, you got the Lions right now laying one and a half points over at BetMGM. I've told you guys this many times. Shop around for your bets. We have Odd Shopper where I just click a page and it gives me all of the best bets from, from every book. Right now, you got them at minus one and a half. It's the best line you're going to find out there. Now, sure, you're not moving through key numbers. But MGM's giving away $200 for free to anybody that signs up, deposits $10, and bets a single team to win this week, whether they win or lose. All that has to happen is a touchdown is scored in these games. That's it. Listen, you could go on and take this $200 and go on a massive losing streak. You lose it all. Worst case scenario, you lost $10. That's it. You lose $10 in your sleep, right? Uh, if you win, you go on, potentially build up a four-figure, five-figure bankroll. I don't know where you go, but you could sustain a bankroll big time over the course of a season by taking 10 bucks, putting it down. Uh, the link's in the pinned comment, by the way, and in the description. Click that link, sign up for the first time, put it on any team, that 10 bucks on any team to win. 
and you're uh, you're rolling in it, so to speak. Look, if someone offers you 200 bucks for free, you take it. And uh, it also is going to set you up nicely because you're probably already on DraftKings and FanDuel. Now you've got multiple books to play at to take advantage of all of these odds. Bet MGM, I don't know how long the offer is going to be a long away, uh, around for. They cut it off for like two months, the last month. So take advantage of it now, $200 for free. Uh, once you sign up, put that 10 bucks in, put it on any team to win. Touchdown scored, you got it. But I like the Lions this week. I mean, that offensive line, uh, you have to pay attention to some of these guys that were out at practice, but I think it's mostly rest. Like DeAndre Swift didn't play either. I think he should be good. They play for Dan Campbell. They dropped 35 points on an Eagles defense that had made seemingly a ton of adjustments last year. But guess what? It didn't matter because they were breaking tackles like crazy. DeAndre Swift, Jamal Williams getting work in the red zone. I'm on Russ St. Brown, even against that secondary. And granted, John Gannon's got to fix that defense for Philly. But the, the John uh, Amon Ross St. Brown came through with big plays. And I, I throw out a lot of what I saw with that pass rush. They didn't get a good rate grade on PFF. They, they couldn't get to Jalen Hurts. Nobody can get to Jalen Hurts, okay? Carson Wentz is far more statuesque than he was back in 2017 in that, in that Super Bowl run. He doesn't move as well as he used to, okay? They're going to be able to get to Carson Wentz here. This is actually looking like a Detroit team that could put up a decent amount of points. I like them at home, second home game in a row, to take this game minus one and a half against the Washington Commanders. Let's keep going, though, with Buccaneers at the Saints. So naturally, you're going to look at this and go, it's the Saints, or, or sorry, it's the Bucs. Like, you got to go Bucs here. Tom Brady has struggled mightily against the Tampa Bay, or against this, the New Orleans Saints, mightily. Uh, in his two years with the he, go back and look at these games lost 36 to 27 lost nine nothing lost 34 23 lost 38 to three hey tough stuff there for Tom Brady and company and if you look at it and you go yeah but Sean Payton's not the coach of the Saints anymore it's Dennis Allen yeah Dennis Allen's been the defensive coordinator since 2015 he's the reason you know one of the primary reasons that Tom Brady has struggled so mightily in a spot like this and if let's just say that you know, you wanted to take the Saints here because I do think this game stays close. Two and a half, you know, they, they lose by a field goal and you don't cover. If anything, I would much rather, much rather take the money line at plus 128. On FanDuel, you're getting the best odds there. Plus 128 on the Saints to win this game. Again, the, the, the Bucks are a phenomenal team, but Chris Godwin's definitely not going to play. And then Donovan Smith, your left tackle, just hyperextended his elbow. There are some issues on this offensive line, clearly, for Tom Brady. Uh, the Saints have a good pass rush. And Chris Godwin being out, while they do have Julio Jones and still have weapons, I think the Saints, at home, uh, in their home opener, can absolutely win this game. So if I'm taking anything, I'm going to take the money line of plus 128. Dolphins getting three and a half at the Ravens. All right, so really interesting spot here. Because the Ravens... Didn't have Ronnie Stanley in week one. Good chance he doesn't play this week. You know, he's been out for a long time. J.K. Dobbins, still questionable. They just lost Kyle Fuller for the season. And then Jawan James, who was filling in at left tackle for Ronnie Stanley, just ruptured his Achilles. Doesn't look great there. But at the same time, you're talking three and a half points, okay? That's a tough spot to get to. Uh, on either side for me, personally, one of the things I'd like to do here, and because two attack of law looked fine last game against the Patriots, the Miami Dolphins secondary is fantastic. Uh, and this should be a, a much improved team. I have no doubt about that. I think this game does stay close. One thing I'd like to do here, uh, if you're into the whole teaser, obviously straight bets or, or, or you know, singles are, are the most profitable in the long run. But I do have a teaser here. I know a lot of you guys comment down below, like, I got this three-team teaser. 7.3 team teaser for this week. I think you'll like it. Saints, Dolphins, and Packers. You can get the Saints to plus nine and a half here at home. You'd love to get them to 10, but nine and a half. You get the Dolphins past seven and 10 to seven uh, to 10 and a half. And then you get the Packers who are laying nine and a half at home. I'll talk about that game later. Down to two and a half, which means you win by a field goal at home in Lambeau, home opener, and you're in, baby. So that's a good spot that I'm definitely looking to tackle. Next, Jets at the Browns. Whew, dude, Jets are not looking good. They're sticking with Joe Flacco. Robert Sala doesn't really have any other choices here. 
And the Browns, let's give Jacoby Brissett a round of applause. He played well enough to get that, that win in Carolina last week against Baker Mayfield trying to beat his former team. You still have Nick Chubb. You still have a dominant offensive line, good pass rush, good secondary. You still have Kareem Hunt, who's catching balls out of the backfield. And while the passing game may not be dominant, I mean, hell, Donovan Peoples-Jones had a 32% target share last week. Are, are we really looking at this and not thinking that the Browns should win by enough? FanDuel's got it at five and a half points here, right? Five and a half. This seems like one of those lines that I absolutely want to hit. Like I said, there are games that I'm okay with that I don't feel good about. This is one that I absolutely want to hit. Browns laying five and a half at home. A markedly better team. The Jets offense was completely anemic against the Baltimore Ravens at home last week. What makes you think against a very good Browns defense that they're going to be any better in week two? I simply don't see it laying the five and a half on the Browns. Colts at the Jaguars, over 46 and a half. All right, so look at this game and tell me that both teams don't actually have the ability to score a lot of points because they absolutely do. The Colts last week racked up well over 500 yards against the Houston Texans. I told you that Texans, that Texans team had a fighting shot, but we got we hit the under there, which is what we went with. This is a Colts team right now that has to come out and get a win, first of all. Okay, they have to come out and get a win. But at the same time, Doug Peterson, you know, newly minted head coach of the Jaguars, tough loss in, in DC last week. He's got a lot of, yeah, he's got a lot of, of, of significantly better players than he's had in the past, right? Or I'm sorry, than the Jaguars have had in the past. You have uh, Tra James Robinson, who's back and looks fine. Travis Etienne on limited touches was efficient last game. Christian Kirk looked solid. They have a lot of weapons here. E even if you throw in some of the secondary options in the passing game. And Carson Wentz, as, as much as it drives me nuts to say this, he dropped dimes in really tight coverage last game. Um, and, and that game, what, what was it, 20, 28, 22 we saw? But Jonathan Taylor racked up a million yards. Michael Pittman Jr., in my opinion at least, is going to be one of the next alpha receivers in this league. I think points are scored here on both sides. So if anything, I don't necessarily feel comfortable laying the four points with the Colts. I'm going to go over 46 and a half points here in what should be, dare I say, a shootout. I think you see a lot of scoring in this one. Panthers at the Giants. 43 and a half point total in this one. Giants laying two points at home. All right. So let's take a look at a couple of things here. One, very low total, right? But both of these teams should be more competent and potently and potent offensively than they were a season ago by a wide margin. Saquon Barkley looked like his rookie self, looked phenomenal against the Tennessee Titans, right? And while guys like Kadarius Tony didn't play into the fourth quarter and Daniel Jones only threw 21 times, you still have some decent pass catchers, you know? Sterling Shepard came in, came back from an extensive injury, made a big splash play. Uh, you, you should see more Kadarius Tony this week. I don't want to say too much about Kenny Galladay, but you get the point. They're not depleted offensively as they were in the past. And while Baker Mayfield on the other side isn't particularly great, Christian McCaffrey is healthy. And DJ Moore's one of the better receivers in this league. And Robbie Anderson was targeted double-digit times last game and had a solid effort. Both of these teams can put up points. Neither team has a dominant defense. 43 and a half points to me seems very low for this game. In New York, give me the over 43 and a half points between the Panthers and the New York Giants. Falcons at the Rams. Falcons getting 10 and a half points here. I mean, that is a lot. And quite frankly, this is one of those games that I don't have the best feel for. But I can tell you this much. You're getting it at 10 and a half. They need to lose by, by 10 or less. Key number. It feels like if I, ha if I had to lean one way, it would be the Falcons. But man, they have such a bad pass rush that they're going to struggle to get to Matthew Stafford. Matthew Stafford is, is solid under pressure. Cooper Cup is always open. The Rams have that bend, don't break style of play where they'll give up a lot of passing yards, but not a lot of touchdowns. Second fewest passing touchdowns in the league last year. I know they got smoked by the Bills, but Josh Allen and that Bills team, I mean, you talk about Super Bowl front runners, in my opinion. So I throw a lot of that out the window. I'd lean Falcons because I don't want to take the Rams at, at minus 10 and a half. 
Uh, it's just not a good number. But this is likely a game on the total and on the side on the spread that I'm staying away from. Seahawks at the 49ers. All right. Well, you've got the Niners laying nine and a half points. Okay, nine and a half points at home. Maybe we're maybe we're overreacting to a lot of stuff from last week. First of all, that rain game was insane. Straight monsoon type type weather in, in Chicago at Soldier Field. You really have to throw a lot of that out the window, right? What what can we really take away from that? Not much at all. And the Bears got the win, but still, I don't know what that tells us. And then you had Geno Smith and company under Pete Carroll going up at home with the 12th man against Russell Wilson, who had played there for his entire career. Very tough game in that respect. But I do think the one, one aspect that stands out is George Kittle was apparently at practice, left, and then didn't return to practice today. That doesn't bode well for a guy that is constantly injured. Uh, some may call him George Brittle and is dealing with a groin injury. Also, how good is Trey Lance? Do we really know? I mean, if you're if, if I'm leaning anywhere here, I saw a Seahawks team last week bend that break, but two fumbles at the goal line from the Broncos. And it, again, just such an odd, odd game. And Nathaniel Hackett just made mistake after mistake. But I'd say taking the nine and a half with the Seahawks makes more sense than thinking this, the, the 49ers come in and just route them. No Kittle. I don't think you'll see Kittle. And then uh, you also have no Eli Mitchell who's out for an extended period of time. This game could potentially be closer than we think, but the bet I like the most is under 41 and a half points here. I don't think a ton of points are going to be scored on either side. Gino probably comes back down to earth. Lance hasn't shown us much. George Kittle is out of practice again, leaving practice with a, with a groin injury. And the run game likely won't be as strong as it was with Eli Mitchell in there. So under 41 is the spot that I like the most in this game. Bengals at the Cowboys. Bengals laying seven and a half points after, I mean, just an, an insane game in week one against the Steelers. Like we said earlier, Burrow just getting beat to a pulp, throwing a ton of picks. Gutsy performance, though, still hung in there and, and got them to overtime. And we're also waiting on T. Higgins, who suffered a concussion and left early in that game. I think Higgins plays. Zach Taylor said he's been uh, he's been progressing. He's been progressing well and cleared all of the protocol thus far. And he was back at practice. That doesn't mean he's going to play. My assumption is is that he does play. But the biggest news is Dak Prescott, who Jerry Jones said they're not putting on the IR and could be back in a few weeks, definitely won't be back this week. Cooper Rush is not good. Is he a decent game manager? I, mean, I guess. But Cooper Rush, man. We saw him even in the preseason, really struggling. Will Greer was 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 battling him for the backup job. You know, this is a, a, a team that is definitely going to struggle. They're without Tyron Smith, too. I mean, how well do they protect him? How well do they run the football? Seven and a half, sure. It's a lot on the road. Bengals, though, with Dak Prescott out for Dallas, a much better team. Likely very pissed off after that poor performance at home against the Steelers in week one as well. I think they could come in here and route the Dallas Cowboys without Dak Prescott. Texans at the Broncos. Broncos laying nine and a half. Speaking of routing teams, just throttling teams, I honestly think that's what we could see this week. It's very easy to look at what Nathaniel Hackett did. It's like the 19th time I've mentioned in this video, but can you blame me? What Nathaniel Hackett did on Monday Night Football in his first week as the head coach of the Denver Broncos. My buddy Ben, I was on a show with him the other day. He said, I'd fire him, all right? I'd fire him after week one. I'd fire him after week one. And to some extent, you kind of look at that and go, yeah, you know what? Some of the worst game management you've ever seen, some of the worst decision-making, clock management you've ever seen down the stretch. But you still have Russell Wilson, who you can say all the bad things you want about him. Russ wasn't that bad. I mean, Melvin Gordon and Javante Williams fumbled both at the goal line. They both fumbled in, in consecutive drives at the goal line. All right. They should have they should have easily won that game. All right. Now you look at the Houston Texans allowed 517 yards. It was an overtime game, but still not a ton of yards. Yeah, Ben, but don't break. Blankenship missed that field goal that would have won the game for the Colts. But all in all, I think the Broncos, after that week one loss in Seattle, in, in, in Wilson's former home, are going to come in and smoke this Texans team. Yes, at nine and a half, I think they come in and get the win by double digits, which is what we're going to need. Cardinals at the Raiders. Man, the Cardinals were embarrassed last week. Just embarrassed. And that secondary might actually be as bad as I thought it was going to be. It's 
bad. It was bad. Sure, it's Patrick Mahomes. I get that. But it was a putrid display defensively. Uh, Patrick Mahomes up and down the field, zero problem every single drive. I'm not saying that's Derek Carr, but when you have Devontae Adams, who had a 46% target share last week, when you have Hunter Renfro, one of the better slot receivers in the game, and one of the better tight ends who just signed a huge contract in Darren Waller, this team can absolutely put up points this week against the Cardinals. But I think Arizona can score too, even without DeAndre Hopkins, potentially without Rondell Moore. Uh, that, is the, that is the thing for me. So instead of a side here, because I wouldn't be shocked if the Cardinals come in and, you know, at least put together a respectable performance, I like the over 51 and a half of this game. Two offenses that can, that can absolutely put up a lot of points and two defenses that, while the Raiders certainly have their strengths, you know, and, and you have a few guys on the line that can, that can make an impact, their interior defense is not good. Their secondary is fine, and the Arizona secondary is in for a very long season. Give me over 51 and a half points here in Las Vegas. Pairs, the pairs, the Bears at the Packers, Lambeau Field. Man, Rodgers, just like last year, embarrassing performance week one. Last year, it was the Saints, right? Saints uh, blew their doors off. This week, or this year, it was the Minnesota Vikings. But... Alan Lazard might not seem like a big deal coming back for you guys, but but the fact that he's back at practice to me is highly significant. I mean, Christian Watson was dropping deep balls that would have been touchdowns. Aaron Rodgers was pissed, no doubt. And they couldn't protect him, right? You had several offensive linemen out, but David Bakhtiari and Elgin Jenkins returned to practice along with Alan Lazard on Wednesday, depending on when you're watching this, which is massive. Uh, and if you even get one of them back in Alan Lazard, you're in business. This is just one of those games at Lambeau Field, all right? I went to a game at Lambeau Field a couple years ago with the Eagles. That atmosphere is phenomenal. And while it's not making my decision solely, I think at home, in a divisional matchup, this is one of those games where the Packers could come in uh, and make a statement game as they did in week two against the Detroit Lions last, uh, last year. Minus nine and a half. At FanDuel, it's at minus nine and a half right now. So you don't have to lay the 10 like you would on other books. Minus uh, nine and a half. Uh, also, link, I'll put it in the description. If you bet five uh, on a game on FanDuel, $150 in free bets as well. If you're a first-time user, take advantage because they got some great lines this week. But assuming we get one or a couple of those guys back, this could be a game and a spot where the Packers absolutely tear them up. And the Bears have one of the worst, really, defensive lines in the league. And I think in non-monsoon conditions, it should show. Titans at the Bills, Monday night football. Bills laying nine and a half coming off a massive win. Uh, I'll, I'll get straight to it. I, I think the Bills cover this. And I think the Titans could be in for a long season. We talked about the, the Giants potentially just winning that game outright last week. And they did. Came down to the wire, but they did. Uh, and now you have them... Look, look, look at this team. Hey, Derrick Henry, I have some concerns that this isn't the same Derrick Henry. A ton of mileage on him, number one, uh, which is a big issue. And number two, coming back from a foot injury that sidelined him for more than half of the season last year, returned in the postseason, but, you know, was, was pedestrian at best. And now with the Bills, Gabriel Davis, Stefan Diggs, Dawson Knox, a backfield that's even getting Zach Moss involved. And the Bills got to, got to Matthew Stafford seven times last week. Von Miller, the addition of Von Miller cannot be under cannot be overstated. What a huge addition. They've shored up their run defense as well. Again, I, I think if you're putting futures bets on any team uh, to win, and I'm not saying you should do this, but if I was, it would be the Buffalo Bills to win the Super Bowl. Okay? Uh, I think they're that good. And the passing weapons for, for the, the Tennessee Titans right now, Robert Woods coming off an ACL, uh, Traylon Burks, K Griffin, what, it was a Kyle Griffin, I think it was. That had that led the team in targets and yards. They're going to struggle. I, I think the Bills could come in there and do serious damage. The only way they don't is if Derrick Henry channels his like 2000, early 2021 form or 2020 form and comes in and lights them up because that's how the Bills have competed and beat the. Or I'm sorry, the Titans have competed and beat the Bills in the past. Last up, oh, I'm Bills laying nine and a half. That's where I'm going. Last up, Vikings at the Eagles. This should be a really fun game to cap off the, the week two uh, schedule. I don't love a side here because there's huge strengths and, 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 and some weaknesses on both sides of these teams. On one side, you've got the, the Vikings, though, who have Justin Jefferson. They have Adam Thielen. They have Dalvin Cook. There's an embarrassment of riches offensively. But so do the Eagles. 
And while the Vikings have a good defensive line, a good pass rush, it, we saw in week one how difficult it is to get to Jalen Hurts, right? And he actually made some very smart plays getting rid of the football like he didn't do last year, took some significant strides. So with A.J. Brown and Devonta Smith, who wasn't even involved, but is still a monster and can get open at will, and Dallas Goddard, Miles Sanders, you had four rushing touchdowns from four different players on the Eagles. These are both going to be extremely high-powered offenses this season, extremely high-powered offenses, I'm going anywhere here to cap off Monday Night Football and Week 2. I'm going with the over 50 and a half. BetMGM's got that at 50 and a half. Everywhere else has that at 51 and a half. So take advantage of that uh, as well if you're shopping around books. Appreciate you guys hanging out as always. Let's crush it this week. Follow me at Lafay underscore D on Twitter. L-O-U-G-H-Y underscore D. And we'll catch you back here for Week 3. Peace.